This week's Yes Group Spotlight presentation comes from Yes Fife Northwest, and it's a fascinating discussion with two guests, Clara from Voices for Scotland and Siobhan Tolland from Imagine Scotland. And both of them have got a really interesting insight into not only how we're having to engage with people under the COVID world, but also the nature of that engagement and just how the word independence can actually get in the way and some ways around that to get out of our bubble, but to actually engage more meaningfully with people who might be undecided. So I found this a fascinating discussion and thank you very much, Yes Fife Northwest, for sharing it with us. Over to Julian to introduce this week's event. Clara is, uh, works for Voices for Scotland. Uh, she's recently been furloughed for quite a long time since the start of the, uh, the COVID epidemic, but um, she's now back working. And uh, b- before, the sh- before the COVID uh, caused everything to stop, uh, they had embarked on a programme. This has had to be suspended, and she is now going to tell us just where they are and uh, I hope she's going to tell us how to donate money to Voices for Scotland because I know that uh, money is a, an issue there. So uh, over to you, Clara. Take it from there. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. First of all, I'm sorry if I sound a bit um, starty and everything. I'm just recovering from a week old um, that my boyfriend's son brought back from the first week of school. So it took exactly one week until we were all down with a cold and um, are recovering since then. But yeah, so I'm I'm based in Edinburgh, but I actually consider myself a part-time Pfeiffer because my boyfriend's family is through in Upper Dower, so, um, and, and my best friends live in Dunfermline. So actually tomorrow I'm through in Upper Dower again to visit the grandparents and um, often come back um, to Dunfermline as well. So hello everyone. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Yeah, so as Julian said, I work for Voices for Scotland. I started at Voices for Scotland in November last year, together with my colleague Alan. And together we are the campaign organizers for Voices for Scotland. For those of you who don't know much about Voices for Scotland, or I assume probably you will do, Voices for Scotland is a campaign that was started by the Scottish Independence Convention. And they had a big fundraiser, I think in April last year now, um, that make, gave us the money to start the campaign, to get the website, to get the branding and do some research into what we can do as an independence campaign to engage with people that are undecided on independence. Everything we do at the moment is based, is based on that research and um, we're trying to work amongst those principles. But again, COVID has made it a bit difficult, or not just a bit, actually quite a lot um, more difficult. The key thing about Voices for Scotland that we always talk about is similar to the Yes groups that we're a non-party specific campaign for independence and we're trying to engage with those people who are undecided and increasingly those that have um, previously been a no and are now becoming a yes and um, I think lucky lucky for us that is increasing and all the polls are going into the right direction so it's, it's always nice to, to look at those at the moment but I think we all need to be a bit worried that um, you know, things change as well, and um, depending on how the pandemic goes. But the moment, at least, it's looking good for us. Um, what we were trying to do before the pandemic was to encourage people to have conversations around independence that um, haven't taken place in a long time before that, just because, you know, independence happened and there was no talk about referendum, and there was a bit of a gap to fill that... Some groups were still very much active, but a lot of groups have kind of, you know, rested, which is totally fine and understandable. I come from a quite grassroots campaign background, and I think in my local neighborhood, we had about three campaigns all running over the summer, and we were all just completely burned out, and I wasn't really actually able to take anything more on. So I think it's, it's just something that we as activists and campaigners are really facing on a regular basis. But basically, we were trying to invigorate that again and have a bit more of conversation and also motivate those people who might not normally be confident enough to talk about independence with their friends and families about it. And that's why Voices for Scotland was founded to give people that 
that do not want to have a label of a party or even yes and no to give them a forum to talk with others. So we had um, organized quite a lot of conversation cafes where we gave people a space to come and talk about what they would like for Scotland for everyone. And we specifically didn't use independence and we didn't actually talk about independence or even encourage people to talk about independence because we believe that the first thing we really need to do as a movement is to listen and understand not the other side, but the people that are not yet part of the independence movement. And so we did that and we were getting in touch with a lot of groups and a lot, not, not just groups, actually individuals who weren't part of groups who came to us and said, oh, you know, this is something I've been wanting to do and how can I do it and how can I get involved? So we produced a toolkit, a um, PDF on our website that kind of had a bit of a guidance on how to have those conversations and how to organize a little event. And I think just about as we were really launched it, I think we launched it about maybe two weeks before before the pandemic came out, it just blew everything up and um, we had to go into furlough. So we've been in furlough from March till I think the beginning of July. And um, that was quite difficult. It was a really weird phase. I mean, I'm sure it's a really weird phase for everyone, but also when you're trying to be in a campaign and because the way the government guidance was done, we were not allowed to do any work, you know, and our employees were quite like, you're not allowed to do any work, so don't go on Facebook and everything because otherwise we're not going to get the furlough money. So it was really bizarre watching everything from the sideline and not doing what we normally do is engage with people. So we returned from furlough in July and since when since then, been thinking about how we can continue the conversation online. So similar to this meeting that we're, I'm part of today, we've been organizing virtual get-togethers. And we've been doing them almost weekly since July. And we've got quite a big setup going forward as well for it. And one, I think, so we had one where um, it was just about, again, basically, again, we're trying to, um, sorry, just love my voice. We're trying to encourage people to come along who are not currently part of a party or an existing group and who have recently changed their opinion on independence or just haven't really been interested in independence before. So we're trying to make them quite open. And that's been working quite well, but we also have a lot of really hardcore independent supporter coming along, which is always nice. And um, so what we've done in terms of schedules, we had Elaine C. Smith about two weeks ago I mean, it was three weeks ago, um, who was joining us. And we have a few more um, celebrity speakers coming up. So we have um, David Heyman coming up in, at the 10th of September. We've got Sarah Sheridan coming up. And we've got Gary Hassan coming up as well. But what we're really trying to do is for people who join the conversation to actually have a proper conversation with the speakers. And I think in some way, the pandemic has been actually really beautiful that it makes us possible to connect with people in this way. And one of our first meetings we had was absolutely amazing because we had people from Orkney, from Sterling, from Dundee and Aberdeen and really all across the country, which was really interesting because before everything was ultra localized. So when we did something in Leaf, it was just Leafers. And when we went up to Fife, it was just Fife is from that specific town that we were. So in some way, I actually am quite positive about um, the pandemic because I think it pushed everyone towards technology and making the best use of connecting with the movement again. So I can send around, I don't know if everyone's part of our email list, but um, at the end of the week, we've got a program going out with all the events that are coming up and what we have planned. And um, in, addition, in addition, in terms of our long-term plans, as, as Julian has mentioned before, our finances are unfortunately a bit dire, as again, the pandemic has um, taken a big chunk of time and events that we had planned to host um, just a way so we're currently operating till the end of the year and we're hope and we're, we're being maintained by donations so we're hoping to kind of get enough donations going so that we can keep a bit longer going because yeah I think now more than ever we really need that space for people to come and to ask their questions without having to worry about yes and no labeling without having to worry about party politics and um, just feel really feel heard and that's the main thing that we're trying to do is get people heard and get their voice out. So 
I'll leave it at that. And I hope it wasn't too much talking. So. Thank you very much, Clara. Um, you did very well considering you, you got a call that uh, yeah. I've got my managed to here. talk without, without coughing and uh, <laughs> losing your voice. Now, I think, shall we take questions for Clara while it's fresh in our minds and then we'll go across to Siobhan. So I've got some questions already. I wrote note down one or two and some of them have been uh, repeated in the chat. So Jean has got uh, a, a number of questions. Oh, so Jean's got all the questions so far. Uh, referring back, uh, do, do you want to speak them yourself, Jean? You'll have to unmute yourself. Unmute yeah. That's it. Okay. Gallery view. Hi, Clara. Thanks very much. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned that the work that you did was based on research, and I'm just wondering that research is now quite dated. Does it really? Is it relevant? Does it matter what that research said three years ago? I I agree. Actually, I was just having a conversation with my colleague today that we were saying that we need more research and have another opinion poll because I think the one of the main things in our times at the moment is that so many events happening in such a short time that deep um, that research does go out of date. However, in terms of longer term trends, I think it is still it's still re relevant in some of the main outcomes that it gave us, um, how people respond, for example, with the movement. So some things that came out in the from the research, for example, was that people not don't react necessarily too well to yes and no labeling because for everyone who voted no in 2014 it's kind of it's mentally a bigger step to go from no to yes when you um, associate yes with you you were wrong or you're not part of the group and I think that is something that is definitely still relevant and that can all guide us in how we can have those conversations the other thing that came out as well again is is something that we just need to repeat over and over it's about listening and being engaging and um, you know empathy works and not necessarily facts and that's something I think. So the, the overall, the overall headlines of the research are definitely still still relevant. But yeah, we can always do it with with a more detailed and um, recent poll. So I agree with that. My next question was: How are you actually connecting with people to get them to join in? How do they find out? Well, actually, that is something that we were struggling with until recently, because through COVID, so we've got one way we've got our newsletter that we're connecting with people who actually subscribe to our newsletter. And then the other way, and the only way really we have at the moment is social media and mainstream media. In terms of mainstream media, we've actually been finding it quite difficult to get into mainstream media and because people are, you know, independence sometimes is still a bit, not necessarily a hot news items for some of them, except of course for the national, but I think there you're already always speaking to the already converted yeah. And um, what we actually experienced through our social media was that because we were on furlough for about three months, it was difficult and we didn't post that much. Um, Facebook wasn't really um, showing any of our posts at the moment. So currently we're working on that again of um, reaching out. Um, we have um, a few sponsored events out to connect with people and to get them see it. But we're also relying a bit of word of mouth still. Mm -hmm. So how many people have you been getting to each of these meetings you've had since July? Um, it really varied. So we had somewhere, we had around 50 people coming along. Mm -hmm. And then we had somewhere it was only five, you know, so it's, so it's, it's a bit um, learning as well what's interesting and um, what's relevant to people. Although I have to say that actually some of the conversations we had when it was only five people seemed to be, a lot more deeper, a lot more personal, and you felt a lot more connected than, of course, when you've got 50 people in the mm. room. So, and I think it's, it's always one of those things that um, it's a bit difficult because, of course, we want to reach as many people as possible. But again, it's really about the individual connection that we make with an yeah. individual. So we might have 50 people in the room, but we're not really engaging with them properly. So oh, I'd sneak an extra question in then. Do you use breakout rooms when you have a large number? Um, we haven't so far, no, um, mainly because um, it just wasn't, we haven't really done the sort of like workshoppy style um, mm -hmm. where we did it. And I think um, it's something that we're looking into. 
I'm not always the biggest fan of the um, breakout rooms, but I think it's it's maybe a little bit because I'm an introvert and then I, <laughs> I, I freak a wee bit out when I'm in a small group suddenly <laughs> with people. And it's, you know, you go from like kind of being able to hide behind your little square to suddenly <laughs> being like, oh, hello. So, um, yeah, so I've, I've kind of been steering away from them, but I think they do work. They do have their space as well. Yeah. So last question then, how do you measure the success of your events? Yeah, um, again, it's kind of, we're just, at the moment, we're just doing it quantitative, so how many people are coming, and, um, you know, how many people had registered, and how many people actually um, attended, and I'm kind of working a bit more on getting just proper feedback from individuals. I've been getting, in, um, yeah, but so we measure success quantitatively, seeing how many people have registered, how many people have engaged with our stuff, and actually showed up. Um, but then it's also getting feedback from individuals and that's something I'm really keen on hearing back from people and having conversation afterwards of like, how did you enjoy it? Is this something you want to do? And mm -hmm. actually those like individual conversations are often the ones then that lead to the next topic. So we've got one topic coming up in um, a couple of weeks time, which is about EU membership. And it was someone who's against um EU membership of an independent Scotland and you wanted to speak about it so um, we've got that set up but we also got someone in who's um, more pro EU and you know I think it's one of those things again where like we often think oh everyone is pro EU and then so we all have to be pro EU but we kind of want to give the space where people can talk about both sides and mm -hmm. not fear that you're immediately ousted as a evil Brexiteer when you're against the EU because there's some people have very valid reasons why they might not be for European membership so yeah it's mainly quantitative measuring but some individual feedback as well but it's not you're not able then just reading Valerie's comment about it seemed that the one she was at most people were already independent supporters so you have no sense of whether you're converting or even moving nudging people along a little bit yeah I think it's something that was still a bit difficult for us, um, especially after lockdown now. Mm -hmm. um, again, just because of like algorithms and I, it's, it's really actually, well, I'm not a big fan of social media in my private life and actually working with it now, I find it really scary actually how these big technology concerns have got you know, such power over what we do and how we engage with people and how they're more and more pushing people towards paid ads and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're, we're still working on that a wee bit of getting more people engaged. We had, when it was just physically, I felt that we were more successful. We had a few more people that would, came along and they brought a couple of friends along and that joined. But at the moment with online, we're still um, working on, on, on doing that more. But we do have a bit more of a sessions coming up that I think are um, maybe a bit more towards people who aren't already converted. Um, so by getting interesting people in, that are that have a name outside the independence movement. Can I, can I maybe uh, come in and ask? Is it? I was at the Elaine C. Smith talk with Audrey Burt. Is that the one you're referring to? Was Audrey, uh, Audrey was the kind of uh, question mistress, and Elaine was the uh, the person that was being interviewed. Is, yeah. Are you still having a a kind of get get together session every week? Like on a Thursday, every Thursday, is there a... Uh, um, yeah, so we've got one next Thursday. So, this, oh no, actually this Thursday, and we've got one next Thursday. We have them almost every week, but not not 100% every week. Not every week. single week, right? Yeah, not every single week. They're almost every week, but I think we're trying to, you know, to be honest, we're just experimenting as COVID has just thrown us completely off our plans and completely our strategy so we're just experimenting now of seeing what works and in in some way it's actually quite um good with with um zoom and so on because you can change things a lot more um quicker and it's more flexible because even the speakers are so much more flexible because they can just do it from home rather than having to travel somewhere so yeah, yeah. has anybody else got any any questions to ask linda will remember and um Kate will remember that we tried uh, conversations uh, just about the same time as you were going to Falkland. Remember, we talked about this in the library in Dunfermline. Yeah. And uh, in both cases, we only got one person coming uh, into the, uh, the, the meeting room where we had cake and 
coffee and all sorts of stuff laid on. In one case, the, uh, the person in Crombie actually was not an independent supporter and tried to kind of argue the case against it, which uh, I don't think, we, I don't know if it made any impression uh, on his views. Uh, and then the other one, uh, the person that came, he was a, a committed uh, independent supporter. And so we just talked among ourselves, you know, in, in the bubble as, as ever. And we felt that although we had leafleted all around these um, state all these around these venues people were just not didn't see it as a relevant thing to do to come and talk about uh, what scotland the kind of scotland they wanted because there is no there is no campaign visible to them at the moment and they they were just indifferent to what we were doing and so we felt well, until there is something to aim for we're not making any headway here and I think we probably wouldn't have run any more until we heard uh, of something definite to, to, to present them with. But you seem to have managed to attract people even in the absence of any uh, prospect of, of a, a, a referendum even. So I don't I wonder how you did, how you've managed to do that. One thing that, um, another thing that came from the research was that it's not necessarily so much about engaging with complete strangers, but getting those people who are already in support of independ independence to get them more out and speak to their um, friends and colleagues who aren't convinced yet. So, for example, our Falkland event where, um, where we got a few people in who weren't actually independent supporters or no voters in the previous referendum, they were there because they knew the host and they were there because they got drawn in. And I think for a lot of people, we should, should never forget that actually yes groups or SNP groups or Green Party groups or just any kind of party meeting or um, campaign meeting is really an in intimidating thing. And it's always about sort of, you know, you've got the clique and you're not one of them or you've previously went the wrong direction. And what we were trying or what we're trying to do with the conversation cafes and what we're trying to do with the get togethers is move away from that and not make it about the that cliquey aspect of it. Yeah and open the space up a wee bit more. And that seemed to have worked. And that's right. why we're kind of hoping that, for example, for existing yes groups or something, that they might be able to do a, well, that was the hope before COVID, that they'd be able to do maybe a Voices for Scotland conversation cafe or something, and not necessarily talk about independence, but uh -huh. just talk about what matters to you, how would you like your future, and kind of move it slower bit by bit. Yeah. And I think that is something that when, when people are unhappy with their life, they're not really hopeful of, about what's going on, they do actually appreciate being listened to and having a sort of, have, have a way of communicating that. And that seemed to have something that worked. So when we did the conversation, it wasn't about independence. It was about what you worry about, what you're hopeful about, those sort of things. Right. Yeah, uh, that's, that's useful that's useful for advice that if we maybe come at this from the side rather than head on, it will be more effective. Are there any other questions? Ian, I see your, your hand waving. Um, just a comment. It may be from 2014. I remember going into one event where they asked you anonymously to put a bit of paper in a box. Where are you on a scale of one to 10 on voting yes? And you put it in the box. And then they asked you to do the same on the way out. So it was completely anonymous. It, so it wouldn't be scientifically perfect, but it gave a sense of whether the meeting had gone well and you'd, you'd made people think or moved them slightly on the scale, just to, well, that's an option. That's, yeah. Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking about that as well. But then I, I kind of thought that if we did that, it would already be like, oh, we're here to convert you. We're here to move you along a scale rather than just actually we do just want to listen to you. So that's why we kind of stayed away from actively um, using that because I think it just, again, already sets the tone. And when the individual comes along, you're already having to say, oh, I'm, I'm from here to there on a scale and you suddenly become a number. And again, that's something that we're trying to move away from having this feeling of you know, belonging to the wrong group. I know that we did that after the Elgin meeting, the meeting in the Elgin Hotel, we, we had a, a vote of, of that kind. It wasn't a scale, though, it was just, um, 
are you generally in favour or are you generally not in favour? And th th there was a shift of people from not in favour to, yeah. oh, maybe. But, um, yeah, I, I see what you're saying, Clara, that you don't, want, um, you don't necessarily want people to feel that they're being shifted uh, along a scale or they're being manipulated. Yeah, Siobhan. I think it really depends on the meeting, doesn't it? I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do with the meeting. If it is a kind of straightforward political campaign meeting, then I think that that's a great thing to do. But if it's a conversation that's much looser and much softer politics, then it, it doesn't quite feel right. And and same as you, Clara, we we dis, we it was discussed and dismissed immediately, if that makes sense, because it wasn't quite the atmosphere. But in a politics meeting, at a talk, you know, it's different. I think that could be done quite easily. Right, yes, yes. Mm. I think that's a good distinction, yeah. Any other questions for Clara? No? I don't see any hands up or um, comments in the box. Well, th th Clara, thank you very much indeed for, for all of that. It's um, great that you're back in, in action, and it's really super that you're uh, able to attract people from all over the country to the Zoom meetings. I like the Zoom meetings too, because for that very reason. You know, Anne wouldn't be here in... Than Fermlin, if uh, you know, if it was a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, it should be up in North East Fife and uh, too far away. So uh, it's it's great that we've got uh, the ability to draw people in from all all sides. If you want to stay, you're very welcome, Clara. If you want to uh, go and uh, do something uh, of your own, uh, we won't mind if you if you if you just take yourself away. So stay if you want, and uh, if you don't. They want to stay then. Thank you very much indeed for, for all that you've said. Thank you. I'm going to stay a wee bit longer and then head off in the next 10 minutes or so because my right, dinner okay, will be Okay, that will be fine. That's <laughs> okay then, we'll, we'll turn it now uh, to Siobhan, uh, who uh, as a, is an author and a journalist and an indie activist based in Dundee. So off you go, Siobhan. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I mean, just picking, on, picking up on a couple of things from what Clara said in terms of engaging people who are not supportive of independence, it is actually an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, and it's, we found that we always kind of slipped into old habits, you know, and when we're trying to advertise events, so we'd be saying things like, oh, let's go to the National. No, we can't go to the National. You know, let's do this. Oh, we can't do this. Let's advertise on Yes Groups. No, we can't do that. Because that's not what we want. So it's actually, it's, it's almost kind of resetting how you want to organise and reset in your, your base almost, because we've all built up really good relationships within the independence movement and there's a kind of a real strength there and a real solidity, but it's those relationships that you usually go to when you're trying to organise an event. And I think that the temptation as an event organiser is to, you know those, you know the days leading up to organising the events where you think, oh my God, what happens if nobody turns up? You know, and then you start to panic and you think, oh my God, happens if nobody's going to turn up, happens if there's only one person there, etc., etc. And then it becomes that temptation to fill it with yesers, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But it's it's about resetting that. And that's that's where we kind of started off the Imagine Scotland. It's resetting that whole perspective in that it's better to have two undecideds than a hundred yesers. And, and that was our reset in what we thought was an, a successful event. Um, because if you've got that conversation with two people that go away and think about it, they might not necessarily end up being supportive of independence, but they might be less resistant to independence, which is, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so it's kind of almost resetting. What we decided to do was actually depoliticise everything. We, we came from a YES group, an independence group, Dundee and Angus Independence Group, and we kind of had a little bit of a subgroup there, but we, we expanded and developed that, and we created Imagine Scotland, and that came from Citizens' Assembly. Um, what kind of Scotland do you want? And Clara talked about that question a bit as well, and that was our basis from which we wanted to start. Um, we are working slightly differently from, from Clara um, in that, I say we, we are, but actually we, we had to put everything on hold, but we, we, we were working differently um, because what we were trying to do is work with existing community organisations. Yeah, there we go. Um, so we've got a kind of pre-COVID and a post-COVID. So the stuff that we were doing pre-COVID is that for, this is one of the projects that we did 
um, we made connection with the International Women's Centre. And in fact, they invited us along to do a six-week project with them. It wasn't political. I never once said I was pro-independence at all, ever. Um, but what we did was we looked at um, the difference between Scottish politics and UK politics. Do you know what the First Minister is? Do you know what the Prime Minister is? You know, so there was basic political education in there, but there was also um, a creative process where women created some artwork, poetry, writing on what they wanted from Scotland in the future. Um, so a lot, some of them were here for a couple of months, some of them had raised kids and grandkids here, some of them were, had just literally arrived. So lots of different women involved in that project. So effectively then we ended up doing a project of the artwork, they spoke about what they thought about Scotland, how they felt about Scotland, what they wanted from Scotland. Um, a lot of them wanted to give back to their communities, actually. So effectively, for us, what that did was A, initiate connections about what people wanted from Scotland in the future in a, an actually non-political way, um, but it got them thinking about their role in Scotland and their connection with Scotland and what they wanted from the future. And uh, so, was it, I mean, it was a fascinating, fascinating project. On the cusp of COVID, of course, what we had done was we had arranged to work with um, the Charleston Community Centre and working with um, asylum seeker women. We had arranged to work with a cafe that worked with adults with learning difficulties. Um, so we were going to do a little bit of a project there. And then we had arranged to work with another group in Lochie that dealt with food provision, et cetera, et cetera. So we had all these kind of projects on the go. And then we were dealing with another layer, which is basically getting the community activists, like the, the Brooks Bank Centre, the um, Food Poverty Centres, um, all the kind of community activists do, trying to come together to have that discussion about what we wanted from Scotland in the future. And we were literally on the cusp of that, and then the lockdown happened. I mean, and that's the kind of key now, isn't it? That changed everything. So effectively, what we immediately did was and what what we ended up doing is is developing a Dundee together which was an emergency food provision and since March I think it was the middle of March that we set that up that has actually consumed most of us um, and we've been effectively just um, we we, do, we had a phone line we um, do deliveries to um, I think it's about 40 families um, on a weekly basis and that is what is basically what we've been doing for the last five, six months now. I say this because it's been a massive learning curve for us. Um, it's been a massive learning curve in terms of how we engage, not just politically, but in terms of community. Um, and for us, the kind of the rules have been reset um, in that we still need to have discussions, but we need to have a tangible and real impact on people's lives. And we need to offer assistance at a time, a crisis. And that was the, the raison d'etre of, of how we, we developed into Dundee together. And it wasn't just people from Imagine Scotland, we're a small group, but it absorbed, we had up to 50 volunteers at one point in the structure. It was people of all different persuasions and none. Um, there were people who were political, there were people who weren't political, but we came together in the sense of, well, what do we do when a society is in crisis? Well, we help. And that was... So for us, it became, it became about positive action within the community. I mean, Dundee's history of poverty is, is, is one that is extremely worrying. And, and we recognised immediately then that, the, that we had to step in and help. Rather controversially, I think that, that, that maybe I was... Maybe a bit harsh, but I was disappointed that the independence movement didn't step up in a way that I think they maybe should have done. I think there was very good pockets of examples. And I do think there's an element of maybe the 2014 movement would have done it. But I think what we saw was that the test for us was those who came up and said, how can we help? Um, and actually, there was lots of different people, and I think the SNP, and, and, and in my experience in Dundee, I'm only got to go in my experience in Dundee, it was, it was, it was the SNP local councillors and the religious communities, actually, that, that, that came in and, and, and helped. 
Where we go now, well, we're still working on the Dundee together, um, but of course the political is back onto the agenda, isn't it? Um, for, for some very legitimate reasons, and because COVID has changed so much now in very, very difficult ways, but actually maybe like at the end of the tunnel ways as well. And I think that, I don't know, I mean, one of the things that we certainly noticed is that what it's done is it's exposed cracks within society to an extent to which it's hard to ignore. Now we've got, you know, poorer people, two times more likely to die from COVID. You know, these, these are real, real issues now that have been, that, that we now have to deal with. But I think that what we've got, and this is the massive positive that's come from COVID, is that I think we've just shown ourselves um, as an example of what we could do independently. Um, because we kind of have been doing it independently. Yes, we are dependent on furlough money, et cetera, et cetera, from Westminster, but how we've managed the crisis, and I'm not just talking about the Scottish government, I'm talking about how we've managed it as a society, how we've managed to curb our actions for the sake of the greater good, for instance. Um, it's, 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 it has actually shown ourselves, I think, that we have done something pretty amazing by ourselves and without the UK structure because health has devolved. It's allowed us a way forward. And I think that that's like actually a really positive thing. How we move forward from that, well, there's two things, isn't there? There's the political, and I think the political is really positive because what we've got is, I think that we are actually winning. Clara, Clara was talking about that, that the polls are not suggesting a spike for independence. It's suggesting a slow but steady move towards independence. The popularity, I think, that the Scottish Government have is, is actually been really quite remarkable. The trust and faith in the Scottish Government has been quite remarkable as well. And all these things have kind of moved, I think, people towards that notion. And I think, ultimately, we're doing it. We're actually literally breathing the independence. It's not talking about it anymore. It's actually been it and doing the independence. And for me, that's the kind of distinction, I think, that we, as a collective psychology, as a nation, I think that we've reached the top of that hill. And it's kind of almost become a common sense understanding that, you know what, we can do better on our own. Or at the very least, we can't be that bad. You know, we dealt with a crisis on our own and, and we dealt with it relatively well. We're dealing with it relatively well. That throws up the practical issues, though, and that's one thing that we're beginning to grapple with exactly the same as Clara. We work very, very community-based. Um, we went into community centres. We went into these kind of, like, small groupings. They were very small, intimate groups, about maybe 10 to 20 people. We can't do that with social distancing. I can't do it because I'm an ex-shielder, so I can't really... I mean, I don't go anywhere now. But So that raises lots of practical issues of how we start that re-engagement. We, I think our evolution has been that we have to do more online. That's because we've not really got a choice. Um, but the only way we can connect with our communities on online is to offer practical structures. And so one of the things we were talking about is, is actually just doing online structures of, okay, Similar to what Clara's doing, what do you want? What are the issues, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera, but bringing in someone from the welfare rights, for instance, and offering an online breakout, which would allow people to talk about these things and to offer advice and guidance, or bring in Lynn Short, one of our local councillors in Dundee, see if she could resolve some of the issues that people might have. So offer something practical as well as discussion based. For me, the, the, the Zoom thing has, has, has opened up a whole new world. Um, it's, 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 allowed a kinda, it's allowed people to engage maybe a bit more. Um, but how on earth we campaign in, in the post-COVID is, is, is another issue. Um, one of the other things that we've been talking about, and this is under the mantle of Dundee Together probably, which would be an online, like what, what the American Women's Association did, an online voter registration drive for instance, to get people engaged in voting, and you can do a kind of a, a whole day 
um, event, if that makes sense. So it, it, it's things like that. But if, we're absolute, if I'm absolutely honest, we're still on the cusp of how do we move forward and how do we start engaging with people. Like Clara and uh, Voices, we've always worked on the assumption that we have to engage with people who are unsure for a couple of reasons, I think, that we've always worked on the assumption that we will be independent. That's always been the way we've worked. And actually what, what we want to do is rather than persuade people of independence, what we want to do is make people feel comfortable with the changes that are happening. And I think that for COVID, that's probably more important now than ever because we've, if you think about it since 2016, there's been two massive changes, both of which have been forced upon us. So we've had Brexit and now we've had COVID and it's two situations where we are, it's been completely out with our control. Um, but here is an opportunity then for independence to be something that we are in control of. And, and I think that's where we're kind of sitting at then is we've got these crises of which we've kind of been con subsumed within and independence has become a process of, or potentially a process of stability. And for us, that's what we want to now create. How we do that practically is maybe a different thing, but what we want to do is offer that space where people can actually come to a decision themselves. Um, I always kind of liken it to, you know, throwing yes at somebody or throwing no at someone. It's like trying to decide between two car salesmen. You know, you've got two futures and you don't know what to choose and they're both trying to sell you something. But for me, the kind of, because we've been told for so long, um, last four or five years, um, that we don't get what we want or we've experienced, it, 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 we've experienced events completely out with our control, then people need to feel in control. They need to feel that they're making their own decisions. And I think that, for me, I've kind of, oh, I, I, I'm never going to change my mind on independence, but there's an element here of if people make a decision, it's their right to make it. And whether that's yes, no, or somewhere in between, then but the decision has to be made. And Scotland has to make that decision together. Um, so for me, it's, all, it's kind of depoliticizing the issues now and talking people through, well, what are, what are your concerns? I, I genuinely feel for people who are undecided. I think it's a very, very difficult decision now. I think COVID's made it easier, though. And I think that, just to, just to kind of sum up, I think that even if people vote no, I think they're less resistant to independence now, probably because of COVID and the way it's changed and the way it's been managed and handled. And I think that's a massive positive for us. Um, but it's about moving Scotland forward as a country now. And I didn't really want anybody in Scotland to feel scared about independence the way I was terrified of Brexit. That's kind of maybe the way I work now, is that I want people to feel, if not pro-independence, at least comfortable with the changes that are going to happen. How we do that, we, we we're trying to do community events. We're going to try and do, instead of leaflets, we're going to try and do postcard drops, thinking about the future, something positive. We're going to do some street artwork. We were talking about moving back to old-fashioned posters in housing schemes because obviously that's social distancing but it's just the message has to be just getting people to think about what where do we go from here now and what steps do we now take and that could be in an incredibly deep level or it can be in a very you know while I'm making a cup of tea level but as long as people have given it some thought I think that's maybe all we can ask at this moment in time. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Siobhan. That is very, very interesting what you've been, been doing and what you're planning to do. I wonder if I could ask Kate, um, I, because I know that she has been involved in the kind of community project that you were talking about, um, to share with us what, the, what you've been doing in Valleyfield, Kate. Because <laughs> it's very like what Siobhan was describing. Yeah, yeah. yeah my background's a community worker, so mm. I've been doing this for a lot of years. Um, and myself and Alison Anderson, who's on the Zoom meeting, uh, we started up the pantry, the community food pantry, last January. And it went from strength to strength, I have to say. There's been a bit of struggles now and again. 
But during the COVID, what you're saying about, you know, in a crisis and about people coming together, um, never once have we advertised for volunteers. Never once. Mm. And we've always had them. No saying it's ideal at times, but it's, it's really good that they flock to you yeah. and want to help. So much so that during the COVID there, we were, like yourself, everybody else restricted. Although we went in and we were getting the food delivered, so we were collecting food. We had volunteers bagging the food. And myself and Alison were delivering the food. So we've, by the pantry, the food project last year, we've had, to me, good community engagement, you know, and we're developing it. Um, over the past, you know, as it's easing, we have um, put on some family activities like uh, the treasure hunt one Sunday afternoon, uh, summer wreath making for young mums and that, uh, ceramic cafe, and um, just the weekend there and Sunday there, we build a bug hotel type of thing. So the engagement, yeah. mm -hmm. as you say, we can, I mean, I've done it for years, but this is on my doorstep, which is good. And everybody is... Um, Voluntary, and I've actually just got pinged from Fairshire um, for the Tesco recite. Have offered me some trays of bakery, <laughs> so I'll need to uh, reject it because I'm no gone. But that was it as well. We were getting donations for Tesco. I'm registered with Tesco, uh, Stevens Bakers, uh, Greg's. So these food projects are, are really the key to things. They really are about the engagement but also how some people are suffering mm -hmm. because of this, you know, young families and that. that you, so you get to know more about that community as well and, and the struggles and issues in it. So in that way, you can help more, not just with food, but other things as well. Like we're trying to do is now, because things are easing, bringing communities back together. Yeah. you know through different initiatives as well so that's going to be built on as this um, eases but what I don't like I don't like tokenism absolutely deplore it that people who say and write things but don't do it I can't I actually can't be bothered with them I maybe call them out at some point because it just annoys me. The, not, the wee, not tonight, Kate. <laughs> no, no, not tonight, not tonight. But I, I just that we are actually doing this, and people are claiming it annoys me. So I'll leave that. I'll need to. I'll need to tell Tesco I can't come. So if you excuse me, I'm. <laughs> Thank you, Julian. Thank yeah, you, Siobhan. It was brilliant because it just reflects everything I do. What you've said. You know, it's great. Uh, I've got some questions from Jean, but Jean uh, has got some some questions uh, again down at the, the on the chat. So, Jean, would you like to s uh, speak your questions? Uh, oh yeah. I think the last one's the most important, and if we answer that, then I think maybe the other two will be answered. Right. So, it sounds like you you although you started as a subgroup of a yes group, you mm. then became another thing with a different brand yeah. label. And you didn't, so when you went to that first, um, the International Women's Centre, and mm. offered to do political education, you weren't questioned doing that as an independence group coming to help. You were something else. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, um, we dropped, and, and part of the reason that we moved out of the independence group was because we we felt it restricted the, the discussion mm -hmm. and um, we didn't want everything to begin and end with the concept of independence, yep. if that made sense. Um, so that's why we kind of almost moved, we moved out of that. We started within that doing the cultural stuff and the family events and those kind of things, but I think we felt that the conversation was always too narrow for, for our liking and we wanted it to get a bit wider and when, when the citizens assembly started that was the that's i think for us the cultural basis it just opened that discussion a bit more so when we went to it was actually 
it was actually their kind of their anniversary event. We went and just went and had a, had a chat with them. And there was a, a woman doing English classes, um, Alan Dean, and she says, "Oh, actually, that would fit in really well with what we're doing." So because we, we had an idea of the project that we wanted to do, and she says, "Oh, that would fit in fit in well with what we're doing." So it just kind of became through collaboration. But I have absolutely no qualms of the fact that if we'd gone down and said we're from an independence group they would have never no. they would never have touched yeah. us so so there is you know so there's 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 you know there's there's freedom in that but there's also limitations in what you can talk about yeah do you still have is there an independence group left as well did you yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 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 More traditional independence things. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, it's all about layers. It's it's it's. There's never one thing that works. It's about building. It's like a painting. You kind of build the layers of various different types of things. So we always see ourselves as almost like preparing the ground for when a campaign comes. So there's that element of people. You know, it's, it's you, if you got you got a Tory, right, no offence if there's any Tory, but if you got a Tory leaflet through the door, there's no way you're going to look at it, right? You're not, you're not, because you're just going to go, no way, never in a million years. You have to almost be emotionally ready in order to read something that comes through your door. You have to be emotionally ready in order to engage with someone when they chap at the door and say, have you thought about independence? Yeah. So for us, it's all, all about maybe laying that groundwork so when the campaign does happen then it's a bit like, oh, right, okay, that was a bit like what they were taught. You know, that was, all oh, right, okay, that was about that then, and that was about that. So it's it's about building those layers. So you work, it's not instead of an independence group, it's in addition to yeah. the independence group. Do you group. see, yeah. sorry, I'm just asking another question. I will ask <laughs> you um, Do you see that Voices for Scotland, which is trying to do the same thing, mm. is tainted for i'm not sure that's quite the right word but tainted by being originally funded from the scottish independence convention do you think it's possible for that voices for scotland use those words those stories and and use all their beautiful look there were loads of little videos and presumably there will be stuff again do you think that could work or is that still under the independence brand overarching brand I, I think it depends on two things. It depends on how voices evolve um, and, 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 and that kind of the, the culture and the conversation that they have. Also, I think importantly, it probably depends on people are more ready and open to the concept of independence now. So you could probably be a little bit braver actually you know we're, we're, we're over 50 percent there's you know my friend was telling me that, that you know you overheard you overheard a kind of discussion in the back garden in glasgow okay. going on about how that nicola sturgeon is hudding the line and how great it is that she's hudding the line and you know so the, the, the consensus has changed slightly now because of covid i think people feel safer with the scottish government so there's an element of safety that, that might be transferred over to the concept of independence so it could be that, that, that voices can be a little bit braver, but that would depend on how the how the people are feeling at that point in time, I think. It's, it's all dependent on mood. Right. No, Thank you yeah. very much. Lots of things for us to think about as a local group, I think. And how uh, Ian's um, waving, so go ahead, Ian. Yeah, listen to this. The, um, last year and the year before, we had far more success on the high street by pushing Scotland the brand mm. um, rather than anything in yellow or whatever. Um, and it was the same people. It was the same people, us, one week after. Um, and Scotland the brand was an easy starting point. Yeah. People wanted to talk about salmon or whiskey or whatever. Um, and so that's the rebranding direction somehow to get the conversation going. Yeah. I think Scotland the brand is a great example, a genuinely great example of, of how an independence campaign, campaign can evolve into much more issue-based. For me, health is, is one of the issues that I always like to deal with. We've done a, quite a few events about health because fundamentally it is something everybody's affected by. Everybody's affected by. Everybody understands it. Everyone knows someone who's ill, if you, you know, but actually it's a deeply political issue as well. So there's that element that you can straddle the line 
between both. And Scotland, the brand, I think, is a very good example of that as well. It's It, it feels a bit like, oh, well, actually, yeah, that's right. But actually, there's quite a lot of politics behind it. So it allows that kind of movement between the two. You could be as soft political or as hard political within that context as you want. And it's interesting you say that that was your, your most successful thing. And it's the same people. So it shows you it's not about the people, it's about the topic. Jean's uh, got a, a comment on that about um, for how many times did you have to say that you weren't SNP, although plainly uh, people knew you are <laughs> SNP. <laughs> I don't know if that's a serious question, Jean, or just a, just a passing remark. Is that to me or Ian? And that's to Jean. No, it was just a passing remark, but to get before people would engage, and it's it's relevant to everything you're saying, Siobhan, mm. people would not even take a leaflet from you. It's like, I, you're SNP, aren't you? No, this has nothing to do with SNP. <laughs> and then they might they might start to listen because some of them have such well, they have just as blinkered a view as we have. They just have the other the other set of blinkers on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a theory and maybe I, I don't know if I should uh, put it here or not but uh, next year uh, there will be PISA tests again to, uh, to assess our education system uh, I believe that, that PISA has, is no indication of the quality of anyone's education system but I think a better indicator might be how a country's citizens have dealt with COVID and if you look at the uh, the difference between Scotland and England, the way that they've dealt with COVID, there's quite a remarkable uh, difference there. And if you look at the way the USA has dealt with COVID, I, I, th I feel that the, uh, the, the way in which it's been handled and, and the results of it are a good indication of how intelligently people have reacted to this crisis. Uh, and in Scotland, the, the, um, the reaction has generally been much more cooperative and understanding and uh, sort of realising the, the implications. Whereas in countries which have got high incidences of it, it looks as though people have just not taken on board the dangers. And I think that is something to do with the quality of their education. It's no, it's, it's no good just being able to add and subtract efficiently. You have to also be able to think about things. And that's what the Scottish curriculum does aim to uh, encourage. And I think the it might well be worthwhile looking uh, and seeing if there's other other um, factors other than number and language that are, are indicators of uh, success in education. That's just a wee theory that I've got. Now, uh, any other questions for Siobhan? I don't see any, I don't see any in the chat either. So uh, I've, I've been absolutely fascinated by what you've said, Siobhan. It's... Um, it's amazing uh, how all these, how you've managed to think of all these initiatives, all these different projects, and it clearly engages people uh, in ways that we hadn't really envisaged before. Kate's initiatives are kind of restricted to quite a small part of our the area that we cover. I don't know if there's any other uh, examples within the Dunfermline area of the kind of projects that she's engaged in. But clearly, it's an effective way of, en of engaging with people and perhaps uh, bringing them round to the idea, yes, they can, that, that we can manage as a, a, as a country, we can manage in difficult circumstances, and we'll be able to manage better if, uh, if we had more of the levers of power at our disposal. So uh, thank you very much for these ideas. And it's certainly worth considering uh, the posters and the postcards and all of these uh, things that you mentioned. Can I ask everybody to uh, give Siobhan a wee round of applause uh, and Clara too, because Clara's still here. And um, thank, uh, thank both of you very much for, for uh, spending time with us and giving us a, quite a number of things to, to, to think about. Thanks again. Thank you.